Steven Spielberg's 1981 classic story about a globe-trotting archaeologist searching for one of the greatest treasures of ancient history has gone down in movie legend as one of the greatest action-adventure films of all time. Spielberg used this movie to pay homage to the early serial movies of the 30s and 40s while never becoming a direct parody of them. Every aspect of the movie is superb, and Spielberg seems to have movie making down to a science. So today, we'll see what really went into making Raiders of the Lost Ark. In the late 1970s, Steven Spielberg seemed to have the world on a string. He redefined the summer blockbuster with 1977's Jaws, grossing $470 million worldwide. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Followed by 1977's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, a movie that made Spielberg a household name. However, massive problems on both sets, like the infamous malfunctioning shark, left both projects running over schedule and over budget. As great of a director Spielberg was, he wasn't financially responsible on set. And when 1941, a 1979 comedy starring John Belushi, bombed, studios realized that the young Spielberg was unreliable and a risk to hire. At the same time as Spielberg's momentary decline, his friend, George Lucas, was working on a small indie movie. dominated the world and dethroned Jaws for the highest grossing movie of all time. Lucas, however, wasn't convinced. He was so sure that the movie would flop that he and Spielberg went to Hawaii for a vacation. There, Spielberg confessed that he had longed to make a James Bond film. The only problem was Spielberg wasn't British. Lucas assured him that he had created an even better story. On that beach, the archaeologist Indiana Smith was born. Lucas's Alaskan Malamute was the inspiration for the titular character's name. The same doc even created the inspiration for a certain sidekick in a movie that Harrison Ford and Lucas were both part of. <laughs> Indiana Smith may have been born on that island, but some changes were made back in Tinseltown. One of the most obvious changes was the name. Lawrence Kasdan, who would go on to pen The Empire Strikes Back, was hired to tackle the screenplay. Other changes were made, from Ralph McQuarrie's initial concept designs until the fedora-wearing crusader that we know and love today hit the big screen. Everyone agrees that Harrison Ford was born to play Indiana Jones, and the character's arguably the one he's most known for, but the character on screen may have looked a lot different and been mustachioed. This was because Ford wasn't the first choice for Lucas. In fact, Ford wasn't even considered by the filmmakers initially. Instead, they wanted Tom Selleck, who was even ready to sign on to the project. However, his contract to the show, Magnum P.I., would not allow him to leave for other projects. And it's probably a good thing, too, because as great as Selleck is, it's hard to imagine anyone besides Ford as Indy. He eventually convinced Lucas as a stand-in reader during auditions, and the rest was history. Now that everything was in place, Spielberg was ready to prove himself as not only a visionary director, but also a fiscally responsible one. The filming schedule went as planned, except for most of the cast and crew getting food poisoning while shooting in Tunisia. Spielberg was one of the few not to get sick because he'd packed cans of SpaghettiOs. Other than that minor hiccup, it seemed that Spielberg started to turn over a new leaf. Because of this, he didn't want to turn in a triumph of movie history. During an interview, Spielberg stated, I decided to make it a real good B-plus film. I decided not to shoot for a masterpiece, but for a movie that would tell George's story very well. I could have tried to give it a remarkable veneer that only I and this year's graduating class of USC Film School and Stanley Kubrick would have noticed. Or I could have just made the picture and substituted humor and invention for time-consuming technique. It just goes to show that Spielberg's half-baked attempt is still better than whatever I can create on my laptop. On set, Spielberg was a new man. He had taken some pointers from Lucas on how to be more efficient on set. Now it was time for the climactic ending where the Nazis retrieve the Ark from Indy and open it. The scene, as great as it was, could have ended up as a cheesy, overblown cacophony. Storyboard artists Ed Vero, Dave Negron, Michael Lloyd, and Joe Johnston pondered over what would happen after the Nazis opened the Ark. The only description in the script says, the Ark opens and all hell breaks loose. Industrial Light and Magic, a visual effects company that had also worked on Star Wars, helped to create the visuals of the ghosts flying out of the open arc. 
They opted for the standard cell animation, or drawing designs into blown up film cells. This, however, proved to be time consuming and all around dumb looking. Because of this, ILM designed a Cloud Tank, a contraption refurbished from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The machine placed ghost puppets into underwater tanks in order to create the illusion that the ghosts had floated from the other dimension. One of the greatest aspects of the scene in the film overall was the practical effects. Chris Wallace, the special makeup effects artist, was tasked in pulling off a horror movie's dream, making three heads explode in three unique and equally gruesome fashions. To start, Wallace created the effect of Colonel Dietrich's face mummifying, as the artist put it, by casting the actor's facial features into a 3D model. The model contained inflatable bladders and required nine technicians to properly control. When deflated, the bladders imploded and created the illusion that Dietrich's face was shrinking. Next up, Bullock's head had to literally explode. Wallace went about this by creating a plaster skull with putty to accentuate his features. There are going to be effects that will be much harder to achieve than the effects of closing down. Then the skull was packed with fake blood and actual liver, as well as several strategically placed explosives. The skull was shot with an air cannon and two shotguns, because America. <laughs> The end product was so realistic and vile that it gave the movie an R rating initially. The filmmakers were forced to add a layer of fire over the footage in order to regress back to a PG rating. The final blowing up Nazi killing goodness went to General Tote. Wallace started with another plaster skull, this time adding layers upon layers of wax to simulate melting flesh. He also added colored string to give the appearance of veins and arteries. The crew shot General Tote on a tripod while Wallace and his team held hair dryers over the model to slowly melt it, and the footage was then sped up in post-production. Raiders of the Lost Ark A film from Steven Spielberg and George Lucas Raiders of the Lost Ark opened to over a thousand theaters in June of 1981 and went on to make over $8 million on its opening weekend, as well as $212 million at the box office domestically overall. Spielberg and Lucas made three more attempts over the years and have announced in March of 2016 that a fifth movie would be released in 2019 with Harrison Ford to star once again. No, I... Listen, the opportunity to work with Steven again on this character that is... Uh... Steven who? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have any <laughs> Spielberg. Oh, Spielberg, okay. Spielberg. I should have had that on the yeah. card. Raiders also put Spielberg's name at the top of every studio's list, becoming a sensation for both critics and moviegoers alike. He also grew as a financially responsible director, something that he had failed to do in his previous films. And while it seems like we've been kissing up to Spielberg the whole time, he really has blazed a trail for many hopeful filmmakers to walk across. It's safe to say that movies wouldn't be where they are today without him, and Raiders is a prime example of that. So for that, we have you to thank, Mr. Spielberg.